Hi, everyone. My name is Patrick Maloney. I'm with the uh, USC Stevens Center for Innovation. And I have the pleasure of introducing you to today's moderator for the keynote speech, Mark Tritel. Mark is a litigator at Quinn Emanuel, uh, a licensed patent attorney with criminal trial experience. Uh, he's worked on some of the largest telecommunications battles over the last decade, including Nokia versus Qualcomm, Apple Samsung, and now Qualcomm Apple. Uh, Mark currently serves as the president of the Los Angeles IP Law Association with over 900 IP attorneys. Uh, he founded the Tectane event that we're at right now and has run the conference for the last three years. Uh, Mark is actually also a reality TV star uh, who's on the show Situation Comedy, produced by Sean Hayes, which is on Bravo, uh, and also aired his comedy pilot uh, that he co-wrote starring David DeLuise, uh, and Friends actress Maggie Wheeler. So without further ado, I'm Silver Jones. There's television, so we have to talk about it. Uh, so we are going to do something different. We're going to do a standing uh, discussion. And uh, I had the pleasure to hear our keynote speaker, Jonathan Shapiro. Um, and I'll give you a little bio. He has a very, very interesting bio. So he has, Jonathan has spent the last 17 years writing and producing some of television's most iconic shows, including The Blacklist, the Practice, Life in Boston Legal. And Emmy, a Peabody Humanities Award winner, he and David E. Kelly are the creators and executive producers of Amazon's Goliath, a legal thriller filming now their second season on Amazon. In addition to his work to television, Shapiro is also the author of two recent books, the memoir, Liars, Lawyers, and the Art of Storytelling, by ABA Publishing, and the novel, Deadly Force, the first installment in the Lizzie Scott series for um, Anchor White Press. Did I pronounce it right? It's close. Yes. Very close. Okay. <laughs> close enough. Okay. Uh, for the last two years, he is a counsel of litigation for Kirkman and Ellis Law Firm. Prior to writing television, Jonathan spent a decade as a federal prosecutor, an adjunct law professor at Loyola Law School right here, and the USC uh, Gold School of Law. He is a member and former chairman of the California Commission on Government Economy and Efficiency as well as a founder and director of the Public Council Emergency for Torture Victims. He is also a graduate of Harvard University, a Rhodes Scholar at Oriel College, Oxford University, and received his law degree from the University of California, Berkeley. So without further ado, Jonathan Shapiro. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to meet a licensed patent lawyer, because the unlicensed patent lawyers are a dangerous crew. <laughs> you just know they're like a street gang of some kind. I, um, I'm thrilled to be back at Loyola. Uh, it occurs to me that uh, when you see the name Jonathan Shapiro next to keynote speaker, the, the elephant in the room is who canceled. And uh, I, I don't know, but I'm pleased to be here. Uh, television and technology saved my life in a way. I was, uh, I grew up in what we call the old country, which is Woodland Hills. And uh, <laughs> our house was the last house in the Taft High School District. And my brother had gone to El Camino, and in the interim, they had moved a line. So uh, my dear mother called up the LA Unified School District and said, how can my son legally, because that's unfortunately how we did things back then, uh, how can he legally go to El Camino? because he's desperate to be a conquistador and not a toreador. <laughs> and um, they said, well, you have to find something that the El Camino Real High School offers that Taft High School doesn't offer. Then you petition the, the school district, and uh, we'll see if we'll let you in. So I went to El Camino, and I, I asked, what do you offer that Taft doesn't offer? And they said, well, we offer a class on television production. And uh, I have no interest in being in television. I'm a third generation Angelino. Uh, my people are buried very close to the Al Jolson statue at Hillside. That's how you know we're, we're old Jews. And um, <laughs> in my family, uh, you would no more go into show business than you would join a carnival uh, or the mafia. My mother was a bank teller for 32 years, and uh, show business people would come in, and, and uh, she always had the same comment, which is, they're very strange. <laughs> um, my father sold furniture for 40 years, and uh, when I told him in college I wanted to be a writer, uh, he wouldn't talk to me for six months, because he said, uh, you have to get a profession. You cannot, no one can make a living as a writer. 
So anyway, uh, I, I go into TV production at El Camino Real High School, and I receive the greatest occupational training that anyone could ever have. Not because I ever thought I would go into television. I was not going to go into television. I just wanted to go to El Camino. But I learned everything from the ground up. Mr. Heinemann, our teacher, taught the class from the standpoint of the technological aspects of television production. We learned how to splice cable, and we learned how to fix those horrible cameras, and I learned how to edit with the old-fashioned machines. And I was sort of connecting with my grandfather, Abraham Shapiro, who was a steel worker at the Bethlehem Steel Plants in San Pedro, and also got a patent because he was very, very innovative and sort of a garage uh, inventor. Uh, my grandfather, to give you a sense as to how fast technology moves, was one of the people who sent away and received the set that allowed you to take your soldering gun and build a television. All right, my, folk, my, my dad grew up with a homemade television. Uh, Philo Farnsworth, the great creator of, of what the Nazis ultimately uh, were able to take a great leap with, which is broadcast television, is as old as Carl Reiner. I've had the experience of sitting with Carl Reiner in a, in a pilot screening of one of my shows, and I realized that I was sitting with someone who had been there at the beginning. That's how quickly television has advanced. One generation from my grandfather building a TV in his garage in San Pedro to my father working as a gas station attendant in Texaco, and people coming up to him saying, will you please tell Milton Burrell how much you enjoy the show? Like <laughs> <laughs> my dad, since they both worked in Texaco with no Milton Burrell. <laughs> to me, uh, in this business, accidentally, uh, working First in network television, where one hour of television used to be 52 minutes. I'm a co-executive producer on the blacklist where one hour of network television is now 43 minutes. Uh, when I started, the practice was considered a critical hit, but not a popular hit, because we only received 11 million viewers. My wife, Betsy Borns, who's a showrunner, created a show with Will Smith and Dana Pinkett Smith called All of Us, which was on uh, WB and then it was on UPN. <coughs> and uh, they ran for four years, and they were not considered a hit at all. And they received five million viewers. Now that would be considered uh, absolutely terrific. Uh, I am very proud to be a lawyer. I, I think of the great quote by the Chief Justice, John Marshall, who said, we must never forget it is a constitution we are expounding. Well, as a TV writer, I say we must never forget that it is soap and tampons that we are selling. <laughs> uh, I do write books, and uh, I've been commissioned to write a play for the Pasadena Playhouse. And we'll talk about that, I hope. Uh, it's about... Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But my day job is writing television. I've been doing it for 17 years. And uh, whether it's been for NBC or NBC, any of the networks, or now Amazon, perhaps even more because of Amazon, I write the material between the commercials. <laughs> <laughs> now I write the material in the middle of the screen where the ad to sell tires up, up here. Uh, Dr. Johnson said that any human being who writes for any reason other than money is a blockhead. Uh, I have written for free, I have written for money, and I find that the experience of writing is always the same. Uh, I'm a storyteller. I would rather tell stories and listen to stories than anything else. One of the reasons I love being a fellow prosecutor for 10 years was there was no better place to see the human experience than in a criminal room or a criminal investigation. Uh, that was the best job I ever had. I noticed when I was the assistant U.S. attorney, everyone took my calls. <laughs> I would truly show business. 
certainly not true for everyone else. So uh, the technological moment that we're living in is a fascinating one. I, I, um, I can talk about how I ended up in this crazy business, but I, I will say that I think uh, it is a terrible mistake that those of us in the television industry do not get the kind of training I have at Open University. Um, Hands-on experience with production, with budgets, with an understanding of the advertising uh, game. Uh, all of the th those things that I learned at El Camino, I've applied both as a TV writer, producer, as a showrunner for shows, but also as a litigator for Kirkland and Ellis, where up until last year I was representing hedge funds in profit participation cases against studios. I've had the experience of being in a deposition where a studio executive sat across from me and said, you know, there's a Jonathan Shapiro that writes television. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, it's a very common name. <laughs> so with that, uh, I want to show one clip, if I can, and then, and then we'll go. So this horrible photo, I want to be clear, tech, technology being what it is. Um, this is the gold standard of success in my business. It's a title card. And uh, you live your whole life wanting to get to a place in your career where contractually you get to have a title card at the end of a show. And many of them are dignified and many of them uh, make a lot of sense. Uh, this one made sense to me because um, I think being a showrunner is, uh, is the second best job to actually being the captain of the Titanic. <laughs> Everybody wants to be the captain until it's time to go down with the ship. And um, I, I can talk more about that. But uh, what I liked about this picture is it's actually taken in the uh, Shea J. Bar, which is, if you watch Goliath, is one of the characters of the place. People have asked, why did we place the show in the, in, uh, the Shea J? The two reasons. Uh, David E. Kelly met his wife, Michelle Pfeiffer, in what he call, what he says is a blind date. To which I say, no one ever had a blind date with Michelle Pfeiffer. That's not possible. <laughs> I mean, you certainly heard of Michelle Pfeiffer, but anyway. And uh, the, the other reason why we put it in Shea J is I had another show on the WV, which I created, starring Don Johnson, called Just Legal. And it was set in Shea J. Now, why have I set two shows about drunk lawyers in the Shea J? Well, because I was thrown out of the Shea J in 1995 by Jay. Uh, and when he threw me out, he said, you must never come back in here. And I said, why? What did I do? I'll never forget. He said, you're lippy. <laughs> <laughs> you're lippy. And of course I am, because I'm a lawyer. So that's going to happen. Uh, just two quick things. Uh, why am I showing you a picture of our president? Well, because I have a story. Uh, the story is that uh, one of the shows that I created and ran into the ground was called The Paul Reiser Show, briefly on NBC. Thank you. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the most important aspect of show business, even more important than technology, is of course upfronts. Upfronts is when the advertising industry spends uh, tens of billions of dollars over decades uh, buying up the advertising for the season. The networks roll out the new shows. We're on the red carpet in New York, Madison Square Garden, and we're put in line based on where we fall in the schedule. So for this year, we were the lead in to the president's TV show. And uh, I was standing with Mr. Reiser, and uh, the future president saw me and Mr. Reiser, and he pushed me out of the way as if I were the leader of another country. <laughs> <laughs> and he reached over and shook Paul Reiser's hand, and he was, he was this close to me. I could, I could see the rivulets and, and uh, hollows of his hair. And he said, eh, you're a winner, Paul. There's not many of us left. And he left. And I said to Reiser, what the hell was that? <laughs> and Paul Reiser in 2009 said, that is the future president of the United States. 
Ew, indeed. <laughs> we'll talk about why he said that. But the um, Goliath, I, I want to just sh point out that um, I think as a visual polemic of the current state of technology and uh, media, this was the promotion for Goliath. Um, and it gives you a very clear sense as to what the intention of the buyer is. Netflix and Hulu have a model that uh, makes profit by encouraging people to sign up to see the content of the shows. Amazon is different. Amazon is trying to get people into the tent to buy shoes. <laughs> so you see here Amazon Video, start your free trial. Well, of course, you already have the ability in a way to see it because you already belong to Amazon if you're seeing this ad because you've already bought something from Amazon. Our show is the most binged show in the history of Amazon, which I thought was great news until I asked them, oh, that's wonderful. How many people does that mean? And they said, we can't tell you. I said, you can't tell me. And yet when we first met, you were able to pull up my buying history and you were able, as an example, to show me every single thing I ever looked at or bought on Amazon and what things I looked at afterwards in order to target me for having made one time the mistake of buying Adidas running shoes. I am now cursed with seeing ads for Adidas running shoes for the rest of my life. You can't tell me how many people you, uh, are watching it? The day after the show premiered, I got emails and phone calls from people in India, Saudi Arabia, Latin America, all over the world, loved your show. Do you, are you able to track all those people? Absolutely. Anybody ever count them? <laughs> yes. What's the final answer? Can't tell. Now this wouldn't matter to me so much, except I'm a profit participant in this show. This is like going to a casino and handing the guy $5 as the human slot machine and him saying, yeah, you lost. <laughs> Ever since I took this case, weird stuff's happening to me. Are you Billy McBride? I'm the Billy McBride. This is one of the best trial lawyers ever. What happened? Michelle left, and that's when the bomb fell out. You drank too much. It's not accurate. Drank just the right amount. What happened on the book? We're hiding something big here. There's one of the top three law firms in the world, and then there's us. The law firm has to stay down. Bill created this firm. He will turn us into David and Goliath. Step out of the vehicle, sir. Sir, turn around. Put your hands behind your back. Your ex-husband needs to have some boundaries. He would love nothing more than to destroy you. Bottom line for you. What will it take to make it go? There's not enough money in the world to settle this case. No! Uh, this was the promotion, oh wait, and see, there you go. The promotion for the show then leads inevitably into this. And, uh, and why shouldn't it? Uh, wait, how do I stop? Oh, there you go. Um, so, oh, thank you. to what they put on the air, 
And um, the reason why I wanted to show the clip is because Amazon said to us from the very beginning, in essence, we're not that interested in the show. What we're interested in is who you get to be in the show. Because based on who rents and buys movies, here's a list of four actors who if you can get them to do the show, we will put you on the air, no pilot, guaranteed, $62 million budget. Because that's what this is, the $62 million budget. The reason why being a showrunner is a lousy job, David Mamet says writing a play is like running a sprint, writing a book. Is like running a marathon, running a show is like running until you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked in Kirkland and Ellis, I'm an assistant U.S. attorney, I'm not afraid of hard work. But nobody ever said to me, hey, would you like to run an apple piece? Because that's what it is to run a show. <laughs> I've got 120 employees, I've got a budget of two something million per show. I have to justify why the lighting crew went over why the catering got everybody sick, and why the script's no good. <laughs> then I get to deal with the actors and my fellow writers. And it was just David and I wrote all the scripts in this show. But I'll tell you what Amazon's model is doing to my industry, which is allowing them to spend $62 million on a show that only <coughs> requires two writers. <laughs> That's good for the auteur, that's bad for business. And remember what Dr. Johnson said. We're blockheads if we're not writing for money. I mentioned the fact that there's no analytical way to know if the show is making money for them or not. So as a profit participant, I've already lost. <laughs> and here's the last point I'll make, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll shoot. The last point I'll make is this. When I got into television, it was known as a writer's medium. Showrunners were all writers. Many of the showrunners were lawyers. Why were lawyers, so many of them, writers? Because I think lawyers and writers have one commonality. Lawyers and writers have the ability to spend an absurd amount of time staring at a problem, trying to fix it, long after reasonable and intelligent people had signed. <laughs> Today, I don't think that television is a writer's medium anymore. Because of the nature of how the product, the show, is delivered, because of our strangling uh, jungle of narrative, there's too much narrative, there are too many choices, a show has to have a star to launch, or uh, ogres, dragons. <laughs> if, you can, if you can buy porn with dragons, <laughs> you have Game of Thrones and you've done very well. <laughs> so in this climate, what's more important? Some guy who looks like me, because we all do look like we're all Bob Saggins. <laughs> What's more important? A writer who in Hollywood used to be known as a schmuck with a typewriter, mm -hmm. or the star who can launch a show. Based on the money, the deals that are being made, and the production involvement of actors, far more important than the writer now is the act. And um, that's why Donald Trump is our president. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, actually, someone's bringing out. And now for a rebuttal. No, not a rebuttal. No, this is, there, there are certain things that you, you brought up. We have a bunch of questions, but you actually brought something up. Uh, we'll have the first panel talking about AI. I think someone had. Uh, Oh, here, well, we'll talk about the one. Uh, the first panel was talking about one of the, uh, the demos they did uh, was about how uh, entertainment companies can then analyze using big data to then figure out, you know, what's the best 
uh, I think one of the, the part was like taking the best scenes of a movie that would be best used for a trailer. So it's the same kind of thing. It's like it's 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 using all this data information to create a product. And uh, as someone that also is right, it's a little bit. So so first of all, talk about the fact that you said there's only two writers on the entire show. You didn't have a staff team. Right. So uh, the good part of that is uh, the show, I think, succeeds because it has a very strong voice. I mean, it, you, may, you may not like it, but if, if you like it, that's the show. Uh, it's interesting what you say uh, about big data. You, you know, the, the, the other view of this is this is no different than it's ever been, right? Back when there were just movies, uh, the studios would famously do premieres in Pasadena and in Burbank and in downtown Los Angeles, and there would be audience response cards. Hmm. And based on those audience response cards, uh, they recut the Magnificent Ambersons. Hmm. They, you know, it, it uh, you know, the old joke is, you know, they're desperate to do Death of a Salesman so long as Willie Wellman lives in the end. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I hope I haven't given anything away. Um, in terms of cutting things together to sort of create a cubist uh, greatest hits in order to tell narrative story that way, I think that we're all victims of that because of shorter attention spans, because of this glut of narrative. Uh, there's an eagerness to just get to the good parts. You know, I, I, I had a... Uh, I had a uh, notes call once with a network. And uh, as they're reading the script, they're going through the script, and the uh, executive is going through the script, and I can hear him, and they said, uh, blah, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, we got a note on page 20. Now, I realized that moment, the blah, 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 you're talking about my dialogue. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, people don't want to be bored anymore, and so they just want the good stuff. I want to talk about things that are complicated. I don't want to talk about things that make me uncomfortable. I just want the good stuff. And the problem with big data is it allows them to target not only the story elements that will be successful, it targets the audience that will buy it. Right? I'm not getting uh, ads, thank goodness, to see a lot of DC comics or Marvel movies because I never watch that stuff. On the other hand, guys who watch that stuff aren't being targeted for you know, the new Kierkegaard biography. Right. Does this make us a better democracy, society, multi-diverse uh, entity? No, it separates. And, and you, you already know that unless you're between the 18 to 34 demographic, you don't count anyway. So, that was sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I kind of feel sad now. There's, there's, there's parts here. Uh, I think we'd want to jump into one of the, the whole techtainment was how technology changes entertainment. So in our, in our, our committee discussions, when I talked about you were having you, the one question they really want to know is, how is it different, uh, having, having had so much experience on network shows, how is the production working on Amazon uh, totally different from working on network show and going through the difference from pre-production, production, and afterwards. You, you touched on some of it. You said that they wanted to, you had to have a star. So my first question following that would be is, did you say, okay, that Dave Kelly's like, okay, I know Bob Thornton, or you were like, let's figure out who the bigger star is and base a show on them. So a, an ironic twist on uh, the uh, power of technology. So we wrote the script with no actor in mind. Hmm. We, we wrote the pilot first, and then we took it to Amazon. And, they, and there was a list, and the list is life. And uh, <laughs> it's a great reference. Thank you so much. It's, <laughs> apparently, these Schindler list jokes are still a little long. Uh, <laughs> well, you could do an I pardon you. That yeah, also could yeah, be, thank yeah. You. Oh, very sweet, thank you. So we write the pilot, we give them the pilot. I don't know that they read the pilot, but they liked David Kelly an awful lot. And, and uh, they said, that's the deal, this is the list. So on the list, I'm not giving away secrets. You can see this. In the public record, on the list included uh, Kevin Costner. And so we had a meeting with Mr. Costner. Handsome man. He's aged beautifully. And, um, uh, Not a good Jor El, though. 
Again, not me, not, what's his name? Pa Kent, not a good Pa Kent. You're giving yourself away. I like totally am. Nerd. But anyway, <laughs> see, which I like. So we meet with Costner, and, and uh, he signs up. He likes it. He loves it. He has one note, which I thought was interesting, which is, jeez, uh, a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, a boy, I don't think I thought that. I suppose he could interpretively dance the closing <laughs> Costume's in. Uh, and then something happened. Now, I don't know exactly what happened. I do know that after we met with him, there were some pictures of him uh, with a, a young person who was not, in fact, his daughter or his wife hmm. in one of the tablets. And uh, the next thing we knew, he had... Uh, dropped out and moved to uh, Carmel, Indiana, hmm. which is a lovely uh, suburb. So we had no, so we were out of it. And then we got Billy Bob Thornton. And it's interesting because we didn't really change any of the dialogue. It really? It really fit very well. For wow. Uh, how does production change, how does production differ in Amazon? <coughs> well, you know, now that I'm writing for the Blacklist again, because I always write episodes for the Blacklist, uh, I'm back with commercials. On the Amazon, narrative goes straight through. There's no commercials. You don't have to lead up to a uh, climax every <coughs> six acts like you do on network television, which totally changes. It's the difference between you know writing, writing uh, for a billboard versus <laughs> versus writing for a, you know writing a magazine. Um, secondly, the difference is we had to deliver the entire product, all the episodes uh, first. Before we went through the uh, okay, before we went through the uh, it's a, he's, I don't know if you see his holy saying shut the fuck up. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, it's okay. the uh, so you have to you have to literally <coughs> produce the whole thing. You have to spend all the money and make all the decisions <coughs> and put yourself out there before you get any feedback. Feedback, back, which is. We thought it would be great, as in fact, scary and terrible. Feedback and notes that we used to hate, and we dreamt of a world with no notes, that's a bad world. Uh, you need input. It's a creative, collaborative process. The other thing that's different is, you know, every year I'm in show business, we have to protect for a larger screen, right? It used to be the production could shoot with the idea of American dimensions for media delivery. Every year it's gotten bigger. The clarity has gotten greater, which changes how we shoot things, which changes our schedule, which changes our production, which leads to some numbers cruncher yelling at me because I've screwed up because we've gone over. Now, with Amazon, I have to protect both for the large dimensions, but also the small dimensions, because a large percentage of the people are going to watch it on their iPhone. Mm. Right. Um, add to that the fact that every single Amazon show has to be <coughs> in post made safe for the world. That mm. is, it can, right? The, 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 it can be seen in any other country in the world. And we, we, there's no universal standard on pixels and all that. Mm. But so it's it's a it's it's a it's it's surprising how different it is, and it's surprising how the things that we had always hoped for turned out to be negative, not positive. Hmm. I, I did want to follow up with that because, uh, and we do have time. Uh, we don't have the questions. He said he's going to. I know. I'm I, 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 I'm looking at my watch, but I think we had time. Um, you were talking again, talking about the, the, the Amazon didn't give you didn't give you numbers, so. They have, they're definitely using big data. Did they say to you when their notes now, in the second season, they say, by the way, we want you to do X, Y, and Z because this, will, this is the kind of demographic we're trying to get? Or did, did they do they, any of that? The, the notes are audience driven. Um, Can you clarify? Uh, I could, I won't. Okay. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, in a sense, it's always been audience driven, right? I, 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 I always tell the story that when I had a show at Warner Brothers, uh, I had an idea for an episode, and uh, the network executive, the great Peter Raw, president of Warner Brothers, said, that's a ridiculous story, no one would ever believe it. 
So I brought him the transcript of my trial in front of Judge Abraham Howe, federal district court judge and lunatic. And uh, I showed him the transcript where this happened. And Roth said, all right, listen, just because something happened doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> that is sounds so very much 2017. Right. <laughs> so anticipating fake news the way he did, the notes from Amazon are, are for the most part targeted to the current audience. Now what is the current audience? It's, it's our fellow voters. It's the people that, that, that we know and love in our neighborhood. They are as fractured and angry and uh, populist as they've ever existed in my lifetime. And you know, you go entertain. But you also stated <laughs> that you it's a global audience. So that's right. You're not you're not are, I mean, are you targeting towards United States audience or you're saying well, so, we want, you know. So this, so last month I was in Stockholm, Sweden for the European Union television drama <clears throat> conference, and I was a speaker there. And, uh, you know, the world is catching up, right? The, the, uh, the Swedes have put out a number of shows. Uh, Germany has become its own substantial market for original broadcasting. And they bring us out there to talk about show running and things like that. Uh, what we, what we find is, uh, and it's not surprising, it's true in the marketplace and it's true in the political universe. There are a lot of people in Germany who think the same way as a lot of people in America think. Hmm. And there are a lot of people in Sweden where Swedish noir, these, these violent, bloody crime, dark shows are very popular, uh, who think a lot like we do. It's a global village. The, the people who call me and, and text me from India, for example, I, I got very, I had a nice correspondence with a lawyer in India who is convinced that the show is based on <laughs> this case and this person and this lawyer <coughs> in uh, Mumbai. Hmm. And it, it, you know, there, there are only, the great Jim Thompson noir writer said there's only one story in the world. <coughs> and the one story is things are not as they appear. Hmm. Uh, you can spot most people a white whale and a one-legged sea captain. They're not going to write Moby Dick. But the audience seems to be more universal than you might expect. I, I will say that, <clears throat> without giving it away, Goliath is uh, based on a case from the U.S. Attorney's Office that I have a small piece of involving one of the large defense contractors. Hmm. And in a sense, uh, I have articles where we were reviewed as a secretly pro-Trump show, and articles that say we are in fact an anti-war uh, America last. If it was still okay to call people red, they would call us reds. Um, I don't. I, we haven't found that there's been any cultural problem in understanding what the show is about. No one gets. Hmm. Well, I did want to actually, uh, first of all, uh, after I, ha I heard, I had the pleasure of hearing uh, Jonathan speak, and after that, watched, you know, watched the pilot episode, and then watched like five in, in, in one day or something, and it was an excellent show, so I highly recommend, but it, there's actually a character in it that I think um, in, that is definitely dealing with what's going on today in Hollywood, which is the Weinstein effect. Um, uh, and uh, the, the character, William Hurt's character, first of all, must have been amazing to work with such great actors. It was. Um, uh, is Donald Cooperman, who's the other founder of, of the firm. And uh, what's interesting, what is interesting about it is that he uses technology, he's a control, controlling character, uses technology for information gathering. Is it all right if I give the little? Sure. Okay, so, so one of the things that he does is he actually spy he, he's a large firm and he spies on his attorneys by recording them, basically videotaping them in their office without their knowledge. Uh, and then he also uses that information to um, have sexual relations with some of his underlings. So that, when, I, when we were talking about this, that definitely was very similar uh, in the larger context, again, to what is going on now with the Harvey Weinstein thing, which is, again, the Harvey Weinstein issue is again about someone who has tremendous power utilizing that power over 
people that don't have the power, which is again in, in, in a law firm setting, otherwise there, there's a definitive power structure, just it's a pyramid structure, and again, that happens. So I wanted you to kind of, you contextualize that issue and, and talk about that. So, uh, thank you. I, I, <clears throat> I get now to the play, which is called Sisters in Law, and is an adaptation of the Linda Hirschman uh, book, which is a dual biography of uh, Ginsburg and O'Connor. And uh, I was commissioned to write the play last year. And uh, I made a film with Sandra Day O'Connor uh, called Free and Fair. And it, it, uh, you can go online and see it. It's a film about what judges do and why they shouldn't run for office. But if they're going to run for office, voters should vote based on who the best judge is. The, the underlying message being not who the co brother is. In fact, because I don't really know this, but in uh, many states in the country, judges are being voted out for being seen as pro-consumer, among other things. So I'm very proud of the fact that the film was used as the <coughs> campaign in the state of Kansas, the blanket of the state of Kansas. Uh, and Kansas is one example where the Koch brothers were not able to vote out the judges. All five of the Supreme Court justices of Kansas were retained, and the film got credit for that. So I know Sandra Day O'Connor, and I've worked with Sandra Day O'Connor, and uh, I, I, I have to say that you haven't lived until you write a film for Sandra Day O'Connor, because she arrived at the Thurgood Marshall Center when we filmed her, her scenes, and uh, I say scenes. She's not a character. I mean, she's sitting in a chair. There's no, there's no, there's no action. But anyway, uh, she read the first line, and uh, she said, "Yeah, oh, I, I um, can I change one of these words because I think you say this, and I, I think what you mean is that. And I, I may I change it?" And I said, "No, <laughs> no, you can't. That's a script." <laughs> the lines. And she said, oh, well, all right. <laughs> and she was spot on, memorized, perfect take, first time, fully aware of her lighting, fully aware of her focus, a natural. <laughs> and she said, I want to do it again. And she did it again. And it added a little bit. A marvelous act. <laughs> so uh, the play is about. So I, I'm trying. How do you tell in an hour and a half the story of these two women's lives? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I decided to do it through their interactions in a case called Harris versus Forklift Systems. Does anyone know that case? Right. That's it. Perfect. <laughs> Nobody knows that case, and, and they should. Because it's the first case that was before the court involving harassment in the workplace. It's a sexual harassment case. And I think that case was their greatest failure. Because that was the case, and the time it was right for them to say what they never said, had never said at that point, which is the Civil Rights Act said you cannot discriminate against someone based on race and gender. But the court has never held that the act actually means that. Hmm. The courts have always said you have to show a pervasive, discriminatory, and Ruth wanted them to say, if you do anything to make a woman's job harder than a man, because she's a woman, that's sexual harassment, period. Sandra O'Connor wouldn't go for it. So the play's about that. And um, so this issue's been bubbling up a long time. When I was a Justice Department lawyer in the organized crime section, my folks came to town, took them out to dinner. As we sit at dinner, a man comes to the table, sits down, and starts hitting on my mother. <laughs> now, Lenny Shapiro has been married to my mother now for 62 years. And uh, we've never seen anything like And my mother, who is a die in the wool, left leaning, left leaning, Paul Robeson was left leaning. My mother is a 
known as a communist. <laughs> Our mother has never forgiven the FBI for the Rosenbergs. <laughs> My mother was a bank teller. She was held uh, four times at gunpoint. The last time, 12 people in the bank said it was a, a bunch of black guys. They said, my mother said that it was white men in makeup. Hmm. And the FBI came to our house and tried to convince Deborah Mandel uh, Shapiro that she was wrong. <laughs> my father has to achieve that in 63 years. <laughs> <laughs> my mother said, absolutely not. And her basis was, she graduated college, but she took a class on anthropology in LA, at LA City College. And she remembered they talked about African features and things like that. And she said, their bone structure, I guarantee it's not right. They're white. And two weeks later, they arrested the guy, and they were white guys in the oh. <laughs> My mother, as a bank teller, was harassed constantly. My wife has told me stories. In Washington, D.C., this man sits down and hits on my mom. And then gets her to give him her address. And then sends her copies of things he's written, videotape of his presentation. The guy was Senator Bob Hatfield. <laughs> oh, a year later, <clears throat> and then one, the allegations start coming out, and I get two, that. Now, I was a fellow prosecutor, organized crime, Prosecutor, my father is a is a handy guy with his fists. And we just sat there and did nothing. And I have to say that the, the Weinstein situation uh, is chilling and and horrible uh, because I have a wife and a mother and a daughter who I adore and and, uh, and yet I, I in the face of that I didn't know what to do. And so the play is about the fact that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I don't know if you know this, Ruth Bader Ginsburg lived in Sweden for a while. And she wrote a book on Swedish law. And her, if you were to ask her, her favorite person on earth besides her late husband, I think she would say, not Nina Scalia, I think she'd say the Prime Minister of Sweden, Olaf Palm, mm -hmm. who came to our country in 72 and lectured about the need to change gender law. And that experience <coughs> changed Ruth's understanding and raised her consciousness about what it is to be a woman. My wife, God bless her, that's a born Shapiro, who knew there were Jews in Indiana. Um, <laughs> a woman who wrote the lyrics to Smelly Cat when she was on Friends. Just saying. <laughs> Not bragging, just saying. <laughs> I'm bragging a little bit. <laughs> She's a feminist. And nothing makes her angrier than when she's in a writer's room with young women who don't want to say they're feminists. Because to say you're a feminist somehow has now turned into your anti-men. And uh, the reason why I want the play to be a success is, uh, you know, at one point Ruth says what Prime Minister Sweden said, which I think Ruth thinks, which is until men really truly do have the housework and have the child marriage, and until we change the law so gender is like race, hmm. it, we're never going to be close to um, we, we wanted you to open up to questions. I did want to, I want you to tell the CIA story at the end. So that will be the wrap up. I wanted to bring us some questions. So I'm going to add this on the show. You're going to tell me what that, which story that is? Because I have so the many. One, the one about Trump. About what, why he wrote the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That will be the end. Yes. We have, we have yeah. a great story. Okay. As I, I spoke yesterday at the Cal Alumni Association, and a very nice woman who recently graduated uh, Berkeley said, uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, uh, what was your first experience like in a writer's room, if you remember? <laughs> <laughs> if I remember, I said, well, I, I don't remember much, because I'm terribly old, but... <laughs> Remember that I had no parking pass for the horse that I <laughs> So so we're gonna do we're gonna do a question. We're yes. gonna do a question we ask from okay. the group. So uh, the qu the question is the morning pal suggested artificial intelligence will soon be able to replace lawyers and creators. As a talented writer, I'm, I'm reading the question. I'm the question. Oh, <laughs> oh, I thought it was yes. Yes. As a talented we have technology here, so yes. 
instead of asking the question, we, we, have, we have AI bots doing this. As a talented writer, what are your thoughts and what, what, what uh, do you think Do you think what you do? What do you think um, you do? So, I, you know, it's, it's an excellent question. I, I, I don't think uh, that they'll ever create um, something that will be as good as what I do, I hope. But what I do, and I have to be very honest about this, what I do is write things that I want to read and that people I care about want to read. And I make shows that I would want to watch. Not always, but for the most part. <clears throat> that means that if you like the uh, Jonathan Shapiro oeuvre, <laughs> you've got to go to Jonathan Shapiro again. And not many people feel that need. <laughs> which, means, <laughs> which means that in this man's business, uh, I am proud of that. I have never been unemployed. I've always worked. Uh, I've had many great opportunities. I've gotten shows on the air, which is very hard. I've got two shows on the air. Uh, Goliath is a critical hit. I am very comfortable with the fact that I will never, ever create a big hit. It's, it's not a chance. And I'll tell you why I know this. I wanted to go into politics. Hmm. And when, when I was dating my wife, she agreed I could go with politics. She also agreed we wouldn't have any children, and we have three huge children all of a sudden. So, um, I went and created a pack, as one does, and I met with the uh, Service and International Employees Union, my first political meeting. Now, I, I, I immediately scoped out a problem, which is every time I made a call to raise money, I would break out into an Albert Brooks flop sweat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, would want to vomit. <laughs> I go and give a, I thought, a, a, a really terrific speech to the, uh, to the union uh, to, I guess I would have to say, kind of an angry silence. And afterward, Richie Ross, who was my political consultant, a very famous political consultant, was Cesar Chavez, his uh, right hand man for a long time, Lee Brown, former chief of staff, he says to me, uh, Jew boy, because that's what he called me. <laughs> um, you ain't got it. A politician needs to have a great first two minutes. And he said, I've known you for about 10 years, and I still don't like it. <laughs> so <laughs> whatever that magic dust is that can get a vast, you know, hit-sized number of people to uh, to attend to your, your work, uh, that's not me. I am, a, I am like turmeric <laughs> or, or certain scotches. I am an acquired taste. <laughs> well, and I, and I, but I, I say this because this is a good time for me to be alive. Because the audience is so fragmented. Uh, what constitutes a hit is now such a small number. Uh, there are just enough uh, anxiety-ridden, angry, passive-aggressive people out there to like my work. I did. I think we should. I, you, you can tell the whole story because I did. The reason why I wanted the story to be told was that I think that um, this last year, you're a writer and you write fiction, and I feel that there's been an intersection of fiction and reality in, in our politics. So if you could just you know, describe the story of 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 what you were told, um, uh, why our president actually ran. So the, the uh, CAA uh, Creative Artists Agency, uh, not the California Alumni Association, which I thought it was, when I got invited to speak at the breakfast, I thought, oh my god, CAA, my agents are finally acknowledging me. So I said yes, and then I realized, no, it's, uh, it's a bunch of uh, former math majors. <laughs> that, was, that was a great deal of fun. So the, um, <laughs> the Apprentice, which you cannot get online, you cannot find, it is like the old Soviet encyclopedias where they <coughs> give you a razor blade and a list of people to cut out of the encyclopedia. <laughs> Even with all our great technology, I defy any of you to find full episodes of The Apprentice. Mark Burnett, who I know, who was in one of our shows playing himself, who was the producer of that show, a very interesting man, and is the Mark Hanna to Donald Trump 
of uh, the, the Mark Hanna was to uh, yes. Uh, anyway, the point is, uh, CAA and others uh, were in the process. Agents were in the process of renegotiating whether the apprentice was going to come back. Numbers were down. Demographics were down. There is some need to create some buzz. Michael Moore has said, so I'll cite him as the source, and he has quoted people, uh, that Donald Trump's only intention in running for president was to get a better deal and a re-up for another season of the Apprentice. Uh, if you go back and look at the history of that show, if you look at the advertising spend at the upfronts uh, toward the end of his tenure on that show, if you see the scheduling changes that were made at the time around that show, uh, you certainly could make a strong evidentiary case to that effect. Now, what does it mean that he was elected? <laughs> <laughs> well, it shows you the power of technology. Because you may not know anybody who saw The Apprentice. I can honestly say I never saw a minute of The Apprentice. Millions and millions of Americans watched it, loved it, wanted it to be true. NBC is as responsible for the creation of Donald Trump as any organization in the world because they promoted him in a narrative structure where he was presented as the most effective, decisive, efficient, and effective boss that has ever been. And we have a terrible sickness in our country. And the sickness is, we really think, to quote Teddy, <laughs> when you're rich, they think you really know. <laughs> The great Studs Terkel once wrote an essay about why Bob Hope is thought to be funny. Terkel's point is, Bob Hope hasn't been funny mm -hmm. at that point for 40 years. Arguably, Bob Hope was never funny. Terkel said, yet we laugh because we're Americans. And we know he's successful, and we know he's rich, and so Terrell said famously, we laugh at Bob Hope the way you laugh at the boss's joke at the Christmas party. Mm -hmm. I, I, I take no credit for this because it did no good, but I wrote in uh, 2001 that our tawdry age started when Donald Trump was thought to be wise. You know, I, I, I don't know what to say about it except besides Paul Reiser, Two other people told me Trump was going to win years before it happened. Jerry Bruckheimer wow. and my wife. Wow. And my wife, who uh, is a very successful writer, uh, was an economics major at Brandeis, and uh, said about things that Hillary is not talking about. And as a person who spent his life writing stories and talking about effective stories and the best story always wins in court, however you feel about Trump, he had a more successful story. People liked that story. People understood that story. It was an ugly story. But people like horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> We're ending on a large note, but really thank you for your time, your, your ability to entertain us and also understand a little bit more about the process. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going to make the pitch that all of you, I'm assuming you all buy uh, soap from Amazon, so you can now watch uh, the live. And we're looking forward to season two, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you.